this is a this is an online FAMATRA certification. Normally we would do this at a workshop, face to face. We'd have small groups, and that would be ideal. We'd have a lecture like we're going to do today. Lecture, more of a discussion because people can can talk, and then we do hands on, hands on with the FAMATRA scoring and hands-on with fecal A counting. Due to COVID-19, um, we realize we're not gonna be able to have these workshops, at least for the foreseeable future. And yet we know that uh, the internal parasite season is already here for some, some people, and it's going to come as we move from spring to summer. So we thought we should offer some of these workshops. They've been doing the workshops in, um, there have been a few of them through Virginia State University and Fort Valley State University. This is the first one that the University of Maryland has done. I suspect some other states may try offering them as well. It doesn't really matter what state they come from because um, it's, as you know, we already have, we can see that we have people from all over the country, even um, different places, different countries. So we can, you can participate anywhere. So what the, in order to do this, um, and you have to get certified to get a FAMATRA card. You, uh, that's the requirements of the people who, who developed the system. Um, it's the um, procedure with the uh, University of Georgia, which is the sole distributor of those cards, and they also publish them now, and also of the American Consortium for Small Room and Parasite Control. A few years ago, our consortium, or sort of our consortium, did begin offering online certification and that is through the University of Rhode Island. That has been available for several years and it will continue to be available after things return more to normal. And some of what we're doing is based on what they have done. So what this will consist of is today's webinar, which will be about two and a half hours. Uh, I will we'll try to take a break in the middle. In order to be certified, of course I can't make you watch the webinar, but obviously lots of you folks are here and you can also watch the recording and people who aren't here with us today can watch the recording. Uh, but the requirement is that you take a test, you pass a test. And the test is basically, um, you know, gonna test your knowledge. And then the second component is that you make a video of yourself, for matcha scoring, a sheep, a goat, a llama, or an alpaca. Uh, a little more details on that. Uh, there we go. So the quiz is 25 questions and everything will be covered in the webinar. I will share the PowerPoint presentation via email, and I uh, will also post this uh, video uh, to YouTube as well. You got to get 70% of the questions right, and I think um, if you put your name down, you'll get one question right. And you can keep test taking the test until you get 70%. It's an online quiz. Uh, there's the URL for it. Again, I'll provide this in email as well. Um, actually just finished up the quiz just before we started. So that's the first component. The second component is you need to make a video of yourself scoring, again, a sheep, a goat, a llama, or an alpaca. The scoring technique is very important. It's not, it, it, we're not gonna ask you whether you can distinguish the colors, but that you're actually doing it right so that you're, you're exposing the membranes so that you're actually seeing what you need to see in order to compare the colors. So you can just take your cell phone and, and make a, a video. Uh, we don't want a professional video. We don't want you editing it. We'd like you to keep it to 30 seconds or less. Uh, there's an email address that I created where you'll be able to email those videos. We'll look at, I'll look at those videos. If, if you score it right, you pass the quiz, then you're certified. I'll send your certificate and then you can buy a FAMACHA card. I'm still trying to work out the details of, of payment uh, not so much for people who live in the U.S. because you can easily just send me a check. I'd love to give you the cards for free, but these are difficult times and, and I've got a lot of money invested in them. So um, I'm sorry, but they're $13. That's all. I'm still trying to work out some payment options maybe for the uh, folks who live in Canada. Um, right now, it's going to probably take an international money order. I'm trying to see if there might be some online option, but uh, stay tuned for that. I'll be in touch via email. So that's what basically what that um, the, today's event will will occur. This particular slide, and it's a lot of words, and I'm not going to read it. This is from University of Rhode Island. It's their guidelines for making a video, 
And again, I'm going to provide this to you in an email, but they tell you exactly how you can go about making a video. A lot of people say, well, how can I score them without a FAMATRA card? Again, we're not trying to see whether you can match the colors. Um, we can, we want you to, and if you look at the directions here, we can make a little card like out of a, an index card, something like that. It's, the, it's how you expose the membranes that we're looking at. Because if you don't do it right, you could be scoring the wrong thing and you could make a mistake that could cost the life of an animal. So we wanna really make sure that you know how to score. Okay, so um, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Susan Shaney and I'm the sheep and goat specialist with University of Maryland Extension. I've been in this position since uh, 2002. Um, I've been in Extension for almost 32 years. And so I'm a member of the American Consortium for Small Ruminant Parasite Control. This has really been an area that I've worked a lot in. Some of you may have heard another person on the webinar, Megan Perdue. Uh, Megan is a county extension agent on the lower eastern shore of Maryland, actually where I used to work. She's actually my former 4-H'er. Uh, she does a lot with small ruminants, particularly with, uh, with people just getting started. And she's going to help out today. I can see that she is uh, letting people into the, uh, uh, admitting people from the waiting room. And she'll also be able to, uh, to handle some of the questions in the chat box. So I appreciate Megan uh, being here with me today. So the title of the lecture is Sustainable Integrated Parasite Management in Small Ruminants. I, I like the word Integrated Parasite Management, IPM, because it's very similar to IPM concept with crops. In the old days, we would just go out and spray a field. And with IPM, uh, a scout would go out there and he'd figure out, he or she would determine what part of that field and when it needs sprayed. So IPM with parasites in small ruminants is the same thing. We no longer want to blanket treat everyone. We no longer want to treat on a calendar basis. We want to figure out who needs treatment and when. And so that's kind of where the integrated uh, parasite management comes in. I mentioned that I am a member of the American Consortium for Small Ruminant Parasite Control. This is a group that was developed in Oh, more than 15 years ago, uh, several states in the southern United States where the where parasites are most problematic because of the climate. Um, it was formed because of the growing resistance that the worms have developed to the dewormers. That was the impetus. The purpose of the consortium, which gradually went from being a southern to an American consortium with international collaborators, but the goal is to do research to come up with novel methods of parasite control. The consortium is the one that's done an awful lot of research with Cerisia lespedeza and copper oxide wire particles, both of which I'll talk about today. The consortium is the one that brought the FAMACHA system to the United States. It's the one that validated it in the US. So it's a group of extension specialists like myself, but also veterinarians, and not just veterinarians, but small ruminant parasitologists animal science. It's just a group of us. We're in contact a lot. Uh, we meet on a regular basis. We work together. Because the other goal I didn't mention is to disseminate information and guidelines and recommendations to help producers control internal parasites in their sheep, goats, llamas, and alpacas. We have a website and it's called wormx.info. Uh, I actually manage or maintain this website. And there's just an awful lot of information on it. I try to keep it current. I try to keep adding stuff to it. Um, if you look down there at the bottom, the uh, URL that's highlighted, if you go to that page, wormx slash resources, that's where all the links to information that I'm gonna reference today are. So that's a very good um, website to use to find more information. One of the things that we've been doing here recently within the last year or two is we've been developing a fact sheet series that is ba basically gonna serve almost as a course in internal parasite control in small ruminants. So far, we've done 12 fact sheets. We've got a couple more in the works. You can see the topics. Our latest is on the parapartrant egg rise. That was written by Joan Burke from uh, USDA in Arkansas. And that's our latest fact sheet. Uh, just recently, I wrote number 12, which was on targeted selective treatment. So a lot of the things that I'm gonna talk about today 
you can find resources on the website. You may even be able to find a very specific fact sheet. So I want to apologize ahead of time in the sense that I'm going to provide a lot of information today. You're going to, it's going to be information overload, and I, I have to apologize for that. Parasites are a very complex topic. It's a very complicated problem. If it was easy, we wouldn't be here today. So gastrointestinal parasites in small rumors, we call them internal parasites or worms, um, it's the primary health problem, it's not in small ruminants. And when I say small ruminants, I'm collectively meaning sheep, goats, llamas, and alpacas. Although technically the latter two aren't really a ruminant, we tend to classify them in this group. And where, the, where parasites are concerned, uh, there's a lot of similarities with sheep and goats, um, and as opposed to cattle and equine where camel is of concern. So it's our number one problem, particularly in our warm, moist climates. So the warmer, moister the climate is, the greater the problem is. So Florida has more problems than Maryland, which has more problems than Maine. You get dry, you get colder. You don't have as long a parasite season. As we go into our more northern climates, where we get rainfall in the summertime, we still have parasites. We still have the barber pole worm. It's just a, a probably a shorter period of time where we have intense risk. One of the challenges, of course, we have, and I've already mentioned this, the worms have developed resistance to all the dewormers and all the dewormer classes, and I'll be talking in detail about that. Still talking about dewormers, we have very few dewormers that are FDA approved for goats, and I, I don't think it's significantly different in Canada and probably in other countries. We don't have any combination dewormers in the U.S. that are available. I'm going to talk about combination treatments. We don't have drugs that are combined into a single product. We have to administer them singly. We haven't had a new dewormer in the United States in almost 30 years. There are two new, de relatively new dewormers in the world, but we don't have them in the U.S. and we're not likely to get them. There is no silver bullet to parasite control. Again, it's complicated. It's not easy. It changes from one farm to another, from one year to another, from different seasons. To be effective at controlling parasites in, on our farms, and controlling it isn't eliminating them. Controlling them is having parasites at a level that we're not experiencing uh, death losses, but more importantly, we're not also experiencing any clinical signs and loss of production. But that integrated approach that we need is, is going to combine the selective use of dewormers. Dewormers are still a valuable resource. Unless you're organic, they're still a valuable resource for us to use. But our idea is to manage our animals in such a way that we minimize their use. Use them when we need them, use them properly, but hopefully do things that are going to greatly reduce the need for deworming. A sheep and goats can be infected simultaneously with many different types of internal parasites. This time I said sheep and goats. They sh sheep and goats share the same internal parasites. Llamas and alpacas, lucky them, they eat the parasites that sheep and goats get as well as the ones that cattle get. Now there's two basic kinds of parasites we're going to talk about. We're going to focus on the barber pole worm today, but there are uh, other coccidia is also a problem, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So on one side, we've got the multicellular parasites, the helminths, if you will, what we would call worms. And we have three groups of those. We have the, um, the nematodes. That's what scientists like to call them. They're round worms because their bodies are round. You'll commonly see the term strongyles. That's because that's the family of worms that they're from. And that's the group that's our biggest problem. The other group within the worm group are the cestodes or, or flatworms, the tapeworms. And I am going to talk a little bit about tapeworms. And the third group is the trematodes, also flatworms, but kind of leaf shaped. And this would be our flukes, like liver fluke. And I do have a slide on that today. I threw that in there when I looked at the geographic representation of, of people participating today. The other big group of parasites are the single cell protozoa. And coccidia is the main one there. Uh, giardia, cryptosporium, occasional problems, but really it's coccidia that we're going to uh, really focus on with our small ruminants. So let's talk about the nematodes or the roundworms or the strongyles. We've got several. 
In fact, quite a few if you look at, look at this slide. So we have three primary uh, roundworms and one primary within the primary, and that's the barber pole worm, which its scientific name is Homonchus contortus. It's called the uh, wire worm in some countries. It's called the barber pole worm because of how the worm looks. It sort of looks like that thing outside the barber shop. So you have the red and white worm, it's kind of twisted. Uh, the female worm with the uh, blood, the, the parasite sucks. The other uh, common round worms are tr what we call the Trichostrongula species, which is the black scour worm, sometimes called the bankrupt worm because it can cause a lot of production loss. And then the other one is Telodorsagia, which is the brown stomach worm. Typically, when we look at, if you do a larva ID on a fecal and figure out what type of parasite you have, you usually have a mix of these. So when you do a, a fecal or a fecal A count, you can't tell which one's which. They're collectively these strongyl type worms. A whole bunch of worms listed on the right side there are going to be some uh, occasional circumstances where these worms are problematic. Uh, Nematodirus, the threadneck worm, in some of the geographic areas that are represented today, that can be more of a problem in a more of the cooler, wetter climate. It's, it's very uh, much a problem in places like the United Kingdom uh, and perhaps the Pacific Northwest and up into Canada. Not so much a problem here in Maryland in the Mid-Atlantic area when we've done We've done fecal workshops for 15 years and I've only ever seen one egg. The one I have highlighted on the right is the meningeal worm, commonly called the deer worm or the brain worm. That one can be a pretty significant problem on some farms. It's a pretty significant problem in, in our mid-Atlantic area and it has been for a very long time and I have a couple of slides on that one as well. So when you look at them, all of them, yeah, they can, all of them can potentially infect sheep and goats, all of them could potentially be pathogenic, but what is typical is that the barber pole worm is the most pathogenic. And it's kind of its cousins, the black scour worm and the brown stomach worm are also usually combined in mixed infections. And there may be situations where they actually outnumber the barber pole worm on certain farms and at certain times of the year. And then, like I said, the other one, the meningeal worm, that one can be a big problem uh, on certain farms. So again, let's hone in on these strongyl worms, these round worms that are uh, the ones of primary concern. Uh, the barber pole worm, I've got these little icons next to each of them, likes it warm. Uh, the black scour worm likes it warm. The brown stomach worm a little bit more uh, in cooler climates. I already mentioned that the eggs of these three parasites look the same. You can see what, what they look like. It looks like an oval shape with a bunch of grapes in it. You, in order to see what type of worm within these these, you have to hatch them and have, the, have them identified from the larva. And even when you do that, they often don't differentiate between the black scour worm and the brown stomach worm. We've had a lot of uh, larva ID done over the years and I'll get the percent homonchus and then the other two will just be the rest. Um, in order to, to figure out what your worm load is, uh, you would there are some labs that will do that. Um, it's not a real expensive test, um, but it would give you an idea of what percent homonchus that you are in your, in your flock. Just a couple of uh, graphs that show the life cycle of these roundworms. They have short life cycles. Uh, the barber pole worm probably averages 21 days, um, but you know how averages are? They never actually happen. Um, sometimes, they're real short if the weather conditions are ideal, which is warm and moist above 60 degrees. Um, when the weather's not conducive to their development, that life cycle can stretch out for, for months. Uh, but basically, they ingest the infected third stage larva uh, off of the blades of grass. Inside the animal, that L3 develops into an, uh, an L4. It becomes an adult parasite, which begins laying eggs. The immature worm will also will suck blood but not lay eggs, which explains how you could have an anemic animal and uh, a low egg count. Once the eggs are released in the poop, then in as short as three days, they can go from egg to 
third stage infected larva. Are they doing it right now like that in Maryland where it's cool and wet? I seriously doubt it. All of this is so weather dependent. From the time it takes to go from egg laying adult to infected larva, for, to complete that cycle is highly dependent on weather. So even weather within our own state, our own geographic region, but then certainly across geographic regions. So this is very much weather related. The barber pole worm likes warm, moist weather. That circle will keep going round and round, infecting that animal unless we do something to break that cycle. Sometimes nature breaks the cycle. In Maryland, when winter comes, that cycle gets halted. When we deworm with an effective dewormer, that's potentially, that's breaking that cycle. Um, but that's our goal. And, and one of the flaws, I think, or, or, or maybe not a flaw, but one of the changes we're now seeing is, in the past, we almost always wanted to focus on breaking that cycle through the animal by deworming it. And now I think we're putting a little bit more attention into what can we do when the parasites are in their free living state? How can we reduce it? And we're gonna talk about a lot of that stuff today. The graph on the right just shows you what might be typical uh, for pasture larva numbers. So the amount of infected third stage larva that would be on the pasture. And keep in mind, this is, this is again, when I think geographically, I believe this graph might've come from Michigan, but this is typically what occurs um, in our climate. And so we, we tend in the springtime, we don't tend to have a lot of clinical parasitism. Um, we're getting a lot of eggs deposited and, and we're kind of like seeding the pastures. And then as we get into summer, we get that big summer explosion. And so you can see that depicted in the, in the dark or the dark line. And then you have um, different types of weather can significantly alter that. So if we don't get the rainfall, uh, you can almost see a flat, uh, or I guess it's the top. Well, you see example, what happens if it's dry? And if it's dry, then we don't have very many parasites. Yeah, they may not have a lot to eat, but they probably aren't gonna have a parasite problem. One of the things that happens in drought sometimes is we don't have parasite problems and we kind of get lulled into a complacency, then it kind of gets wet in the fall, and then the parasites resume their life cycles and we start to have problems. We did a buck test at our research center for 11 years. And I always told people the best possible scenario for those bucks to be healthy and to grow was a drought, a slight drought, not, not a major drought, because a major drought means there's nothing to eat. But a slight drought, goats graze well in the drought and they, and they had much less parasites to deal with in the drought. So we have fewer problems when it doesn't rain. So again, all of this is tied to warmth, temperatures, and that moisture. A couple of other things that are important biologically about parasites. The first is what we call hypobiosis. And that's the ability of these roundworms to undergo a period of arrested development, which is called hypobiosis. So they kind of stop their life cycle. They just, they stop, become inactive. And this may last for several months. And they do it at a time of the year when the conditions in the environment are not favorable for their development. In a state like Maryland or, or any state that has cold winters, it's the winter time. So once we start kind of getting past that first frost and it starts getting cold, our parasites go into an arrested state. We really don't have a problem with them. They're still there, ready to wreak havoc in the spring. As we go up into our northern climates, Michigan, and I suspect Alberta, that's the primary way that parasites survive in the system is through that hypobiotic larva. The farther we go south, we're gonna get a lot more survival over the winter on pasture. And we get into a state like Florida and Louisiana, parasites are almost are practically a year round problem. Again, all this stuff is tied to climate. Now you go to other parts of the, of the country or the world, and that hypobiosis occurs when it's hot and dry because that's not conducive to that worm's development. It doesn't like cold and dry and it doesn't like hot and dry. Warm and moist. The other thing important from a biological standpoint, and this has to do with the animals, and that's the parapartrid egg rise. This is a natural phenomenon where the female temporarily loses her acquired immunity 
at the time or around the time of giving birth. You know, it's natural for sheep and goats to develop immunity to parasites. And in a mature animal, especially a sheep, is pretty immune. But that immunity is compromised around the time of parturition. What happens? We get an elevated egg count. She's got a higher worm burden. Hey, she may not be clinically sick herself, but if she's out on pasture, she's going to deposit a lot more eggs on the pasture. As those eggs develop into larva, we're going to get highly infected pastures that her lambs are going to graze. So the parapartner egg rise is a major source of infection on our pastures. We don't know exactly what it's caused by, but it's believed to be caused by a hormonal suppression of immunity and the nutritional stress of, of, of late pregnancy and lactation. It can start a week or two before lambing and kidding, and it can last for up to about six to eight weeks. Um, in sheep, I don't know so much about goats because I haven't read any papers, but it tends to peak about 30 days after lambing. And again, it's the major source of contamination of our pastures. Very often, these two things occur at the same time. So if you lamb or kid in the spring, the arrested larvae are resuming their life cycle. So that's one source of pasture contamination. And the female is undergoing this parapartner egg rise. That's another source of uh, pasture contamination. And again, the spring is kind of seeding things for the fall. And again, I'm talking about kind of a, our mid-Atlantic climate. And that summer is when things can get really bad. Again, it, it can move. It can, when problems are, are the most, when there's peak transmission, it can be shifted by weather. You know, do you have a warm spring or cool spring? You know, what's it like? We had a very mild weather. We're still having, or at least right now, we're having a pretty cool spring. So, so things should take longer. That life cycle should be stretched out. So again, weather can move things around a lot. And a lot of the stuff we talk about are some general concepts. And you always got to keep in mind how weather can, can shift some of these things a month or two. So what are the signs of, of, of these uh, parasites? Um, clinical signs. They always have them. It, it's, it's not that common that a sheep or goat or llama or paca would not have parasites in its gut. It's not that... Uh, uh, common to have uh, negative fecal egg counts. They're certainly, they certainly happen, but that doesn't mean they don't have eggs or they don't have parasites in their gut. So it's normal to have them. So when we talk about clinical signs, we're looking for clinical disease. So with the barber pole worm, the barber pole worm is, is um, in the abomasum, which is the true stomach. And um, it's a blood sucking parasite. And so its primary symptom is blood and protein loss. So anemia. We measure that in the animal. We would measure it by taking a blood sample, a blood hematocrit, what we call pack cell volume, what percentage of red blood cells. That's the diagnostic test for the barber pole worm, not a fecal test. A bottle draw, when we get the, uh, the official name is submandibular edema, but it's basically a swelling under the jaw. They all don't get that. When you do see bottle jaw, um, you, you better give that animal an effective treatment. I think you see it a lot more in sheep than you do goats. I can't speak to it in llamas or, or alpacas. Perhaps Megan can answer that in the chat box because she has a lot of experience with, with alpacas. Uh, they usually lose weight and body condition. Uh, you notice I have diarrhea or scours crossed off. That is not a symptom of the barber pole worm. That is not. So if you've got animals that, that are scouring, um, it's not the barber pole worm. Doesn't mean it couldn't be other parasites, but it's not the barber pole worm. Uh, they get weak. Uh, they don't want to eat. Eventually, they die if, if, left, if, if, if left untreated. And of course, sometimes the only symptom of the barber pole worm is just dead. You, you go out there and you find an animal dead, particularly a young animal, because they have a lot less blood. Things can happen a lot quicker. So we do get sudden death with the barber pole worm. We also get more gradual uh, effects of the barber pole worm. A lot of people say, hey, the FAMACHA system doesn't work because by the time you, you see the anemia, it's too late. But that's not necessarily true. In a sudden death, obviously, uh, you know, you didn't do anything, but usually you can, you can catch that anemia at a time where you can treat it. Now, the other two worms, the cousins, the brown stomach worm, um, the black scour worm, they're the ones that give you the scours, the dirty butts, the dagginess. So they create a hypersensitivity of the gut 
and inflammation. Um, and, I, and sometimes the primary symptom is not even production loss, it's just uh, that messy butt. Uh, a couple years ago, I traveled to New, Ze to New Zealand and a common practice for them is uh, to constantly crutch out those lambs and use before they take them to market. Um, and because the primary worms over there are not so much the barber pole worms, but the ones that cause scours. And very often the lambs look really good, but they just had really dirty butts. So, so that's problematic. But generally speaking, these parasites do, do take a bite out of productivity. They, the animals lose weight and condition. They don't grow as fast. And, and in certain circumstances, uh, it can cause death. Uh, for, for a lot of us, especially in the summertime, uh, the effects of these parasites are usually additive with, with the barber pole worm. Um, here in Maryland, when we do larva ID in the middle of summer, we're over 90% barber pole worm. Um, but you always have to keep in mind that, that these can also cause problems. Here's just some pictures showing what I talked about. Uh, the U on the left, of course, with, with bottle jaw. The, the picture of the eye, that's not proper for matcha scoring, but you sure can see that that is white all the way around. Uh, the next lamb, just a fairly common looking animal that's not thriving and not doing well. He doesn't have diarrhea, he's just very poor, and, and he definitely was one suffering from barber paw worm infection. And then the one on the right, the, the scouring, the, the dirty butt, classic uh, of those other worms, the scour causing worms also could be coccidia or could be something that's not parasitic at all. Okay, I mentioned that I wanted to talk a little bit about the meningeal worm because it can be a problem uh, for some people on some farms. It, in particular, I think llamas and pacas are very vulnerable to this parasite. It's a parasite of a white-tailed deer so any place where you have white-tailed deer, uh, you have potential. It doesn't really cause problems in the deer, uh, but the parasite gets into an abnormal host, which includes sheep, goats, llamas, alpacas, um, some other wild uh, species. I, I'm, I don't think cattle are affected. I do know at least one instance where a horse was affected. So they're an abnormal host for this parasite. So what that means is they're also a dead-end host. You know, there's no, there's no eggs, they're a dead end host. Now, the parasite has an indirect life cycle, which means it needs a snail or slug as its intermediate host. So if you got deer, but no snails or slugs, no problem. If you got snails or slugs and no deer, no problem. You need them both. Snails and slugs tend to be found in uh, kind of uh, wet, low-lying areas, which can help with where, how can I control it? But the sheep or goat or alpaca or llama will ingest that snail or slug or the slime stream on the forage. It'll ingest that infected third stage larva. Eventually that larva will travel from the intestinal tract to the spinal cord to the brain. So it'll, it'll, it'll move out of the digestive system into the central nervous system. And that's where treatment gets challenging because we're not certain whether dewormers can cross that barrier. You can't diagnose the meningeal worm very easily. You can't do a fecal test because there, there's no eggs. Uh, I believe you can test spinal fluid, but uh, usually diagnosis is based on the clinical signs and kind of the history. Uh, it's even difficult to, to locate the parasite in necropsy. So what kind of symptoms do you see? Um, it, it, sometimes it can start out with a lame, just a lameness. Or, or, or they're they're not moving weak, uh, you know, correctly. A lot of people won't really notice it until they're weak in that in the hind end. Uh, in goats, in particular, they can get a very intense itching. It doesn't necessarily kill them. They they actually maintain a decent appetite. There aren't any proven or approved uh, treatment protocols. Uh, you can Google it and find what people do, but fortunately, Cornell University in New York has been evaluating the treatment protocols that have been used for, for years. And they've also developed a website. Treatment for the meningeal worm is, the drug of choice is Safeguard, which is fenbendazole is, is the name of the drug. It's usually given for multiple days and it's usually given at high doses. That means it's extra label drug use. That means it requires a veterinarian. And then that's combined with the use of an anti-inflammatory drug. 
dexamethasone if the animal's not pregnant and banamine if, if the animal's pregnant. That's also a prescription drug. So Cornell's been looking at this treatment call uh, protocol with sheep and goats, and they report the results on their website. The other thing they did is they divided their groups into two, and they also gave injectable ivermectin to see if that had any effect. Because you often hear that people give, uh, particularly camelid producers, will give ivermectin uh, monthly to try to prevent problems with the meningeal worm, and they wanted to see if it had any effect. Um, and I and I think the consensus it didn't have an effect, and then the concern because it's not they're not certain whether it can cross that blood-brain barrier, and I guess they're thinking fenbendazole can. So fenbendazole is the treatment of choice. You can see the URL uh, at the bottom. It's a good web page all about the meningeal worm, and it talks about this uh, the work that they've done there. Um, they also in the past were looking at a vaccine, but I don't think they, they got very far along on that. That's a pretty long URL. And again, I'll be providing this PowerPoint. You'll be able to copy that down if, if this is important to you. Okay, let's talk a little bit about tapeworms. Um, tapeworms are easy to diagnose because you can see the segments in their feces, or you can see a picture like this, this lamb passing that lovely tapeworm. Ironically, this is one of my most popular pictures on Flickr, this lamb passing a tapeworm. Uh, it's really the only worm that you can see in the feces or outside of the body. Um, I think you can see, Homonchus is the next largest worm, and probably if you look, if they were passed outside of the body and they were that would be one that if you look really closely, it perhaps all the rest of the worms are, are probably too small. But tapeworms are big. And, and that's actually why they, in some circumstances, could be problematic. And I'll talk about that in the last, next slide. Tapeworms have an indirect life cycle. They need a pasture or grass mite to serve as an intermediate host. But I don't think there's any shortage of those. Most of the parasitologists are in agreement that tapeworms are not pathogenic. They do not cause problems. They don't. They don't cause weight loss. They don't, they don't cause problems. Almost all the research that's been done with tapeworms, and, and I'll confess it's all been in sheep that I'm aware of, shows there's no benefit to treating for them. The animals develop immunity at a very young age. That's why it's actually called the milk tapeworm. They're affected when they're nursing. So when they're weaned, they become immune to them. So the general consensus is that they are not a problem. They're just nasty. And they're the only ones we can really, really see. So heavy infestations of tapeworms could cause mild unthriftiness, could cause some gut disturbances. Uh, intestinal blockages, like you see here on the right, uh, those can occur. They are rare, although sometimes I wonder how would we even know if we didn't do a necropsy. Maybe they're more common than we think. I don't know. Um, they can alter intestinal function. Again, they're big. They're a big worm, and if they're clogging up, not completely, but if there's a lot of them in the gut, they can affect gut motility and predispose animals to enterotoxemia. So these are kind of heavy infestations. Some situations this could happen, but generally speaking, tapeworms aren't a problem. Treatment with tapeworms has to have specific drugs. All the dewormers are not effective against tapeworms. Uh, Safeguard is, but it's not labeled. So you have to double the dosage, which makes it extra label drug use. Valbazin, which is approved for sheep, uh, is, is effective against tapeworms. For goats, it's only approved for liver flukes, so it would be extra label drug use. The drug of choice is actually praziquantel. And the only way to get praziquantel uh, is to use a horse dewormer. There's like three different horse dewormers that have praziquantel. So again, that would be extra label drug use that you would need to work with your veterinarian. Other countries, I don't know who all might be on this call, but there are, uh, Praziquantel is included in combination products in other countries, but not in the US, and I seriously doubt in Canada. The other tapeworm that is important, and this is usually uh, depends on where the location is, but sheep and goats can be an intermediate host for tapeworms that, call, that infect dogs. Uh, it's called sheep measles. It can result in cysts in the meat. It's not a public health concern, but hey, no one wants to buy meat with cysts in it. Uh, the point of control is the dog, uh, but it's probably uh, 
may not be a problem in your area. You'd have to ask meat inspectors if they ever have seen them. I know one time I asked the meat inspector in Maryland and he didn't even know what I was talking about, but there can be locations where they're definitely a problem. Okay, liver flukes. I added this slide once I looked at the representation uh, in today's webinar. Uh, I eliminated liver flukes from my presentation because hey, they're, don't, they're not a problem in the mid-Atlantic area. They are a regional problem in the U.S., and they're certainly a problem in certain parts of the world. In the U.S., we typically think of the Pacific Northwest, like Oregon, and I noticed somebody was from Oregon. Uh, the Gulf Coast states, like, like Louisiana, and perhaps like uh, parts of the, the, the Great Lakes states as well. Um, they are associated with grazing wet, poorly drained areas. Um, you can't just all of a sudden you have a wet year and have a liver fluke problem. They actually have to be there. And then you have those type of conditions. Uh, similar to the meningeal worm, a snail or slug is an intermediate host. The symptoms can be similar to the barber pole worm. In fact, there's a study where they used FOMACHA to help make the worming decisions or treatment decisions for liver fluke. Chances are, if you're dealing with a liver fluke disease, you're probably going to interact with your veterinarian because you're probably, unless you're pretty familiar with it, it's probably going to be something new to you. Um, and again, it can be very similar to, to what we see with the barber pole worm. Valbazin is effective against adult liver flukes. It is approved for sheep and it has a conditional license for goats. Ivomec Plus has, has another drug in it that's effective against liver flukes, and that would be extra label drug use. But uh, there are certainly some regions where this could be a problem. Liver flukes have a much uh, more drawn out uh, life cycle. Uh, deworming at proper times is, is essential to controlling this parasite. Okay, wanna just spend a couple of slides on coccidia, because I will honestly say that coccidia, it, it, it's like there's, there's two twin towers of, of problems and, and the barber pole worm is one and coccidia is usually the second. And sometimes on some farms, this could be the more significant challenge, particularly if the sheep are more intensively managed or managed under confinement or dry lot situation. So coccidia are the single cell protozoa. What's unique about them is they are host specific. Not only do sheep and goats not get the um, coccidia strains that poultry and rabbits get, but sheep and goats do not share the same strains of coccidia. The other thing that's interesting is not all coccidia strains are pathogenic. This is pretty important if you start looking at fecals and you get 20,000 oocysts. Well, are they 20,000 oocysts from a pathogenic strain or, or, or one that's not problematic? Uh, they do have a direct life cycle, but it tends to be more, much more complicated than stomach worms. There's different points of, of development and some of the coccidia stats focus on some of those different places. What coccidia do is they damage the lining of the small intestines and they can affect nutrient absorption. You can see a picture of the eggs. The eggs are they're still over, oval shaped, but they're a lot smaller. So coccidiosis, which is what we call clinical disease, is most commonly seen in lambs and kids around the time of weaning. It could be before weaning, it could be after, because for one, we wean at different ages. And depending on your production system, it could be a problem at different times. Real intensively managed uh, operations, it's gonna probably be a challenge when they're younger versus older on say a more extensively managed operation. It is most common in intensively managed operations, particularly confinement and dry lot. But don't let that think make you think it can't occur on a, in a pasture setting as well, because it can. And in some cases, we can create a lot of the things that we have in confinement on a pasture situation with some of our intensive grazing situations. Or when you start thinking about animals congregating around a shelter, a mineral feeder, or water, a self feeder, we can create those same kind of poor hygienic conditions because it is most commonly associated with poor hygiene, wet conditions, overcrowding, stress, poor management, things like that. On the other hand, you can be the best manager in the world and it just rains so much, your animals behavior changes and that can put you at risk. Sheep develop strong and lifelong immunity to coccidiosis. It occurs relatively young. Um, it's it's uh, rare to, for, it would be rare for an adult sheep to have coccidiosis. Goats, and this is similar with stomach worms, they never develop as strong an immunity and it is possible to have coccidiosis in goats of any age, but it's certainly most common in young 
lambs and kids under five months of age. But the adults are a source of infection. They have small numbers of coccidia that they deposit into the environment that will affect the lambs and kids. And just like the stomach worms, they, the, the oocyst counts do increase around the time of parturition. So the peripartite egg rise is also a rise in oocysts as well. So the signs of clinical coccidiosis, this is when you're more likely to see your scours or your diarrhea. If I have a, 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 an eight week old lamb with scours or, or kid goat, uh, this is the first thing I'm thinking he has. Uh, now, they don't always have diarrhea. It's possible to have clinical disease without diarrhea, but sometimes it can be pretty nasty and, and foul smelling. Sometimes it can contain blood or mucus, but again, not always. Sometimes you just see dirty hocks in a tail like you see in this uh, lamb here. Uh, in wool sheep, they, they might be more open fleece. Uh, uh, with the goat, the hair coat just doesn't look good. Uh, they get depressed, uh, like this lamb. Anorexia, they're not, they don't want to eat. They get dehydrated. They can get anemic, and they can die. Um, it's not as pathogenic, I would say, as the barber pole worm, but it's certainly possible that they can die. Running a fecal um, it has its limitations because um, they can have clinical disease and have very low oocyst count and they can be perfectly, and they can be, and vice versa. So they don't always correlate. And then as I mentioned, not all the strains of coccidia are pathogenic. Usually when research is done with coccidia, if they're trying to see if a certain treatment works, they will actually uh, determine what kind of, what strain of coccidia the animals are infected with. Sometimes uh, the animals recover and do just fine, but sometimes they're kind of stunted and they have some long lasting effects because that lining of that small intestines has been damaged and that's where nutrient absorption occurs. Coccidiosis is different than worms in the sense that we can use products, drugs if you will, to prevent a clinical outbreak, to prevent clinical disease. We, do, we don't have that, uh, at least with a drug, we don't have that option with worms. So we have things that we can put in the feed, the mineral, they're often put in milk replacer, to try to prevent outbreaks of coccidia. So they affect different places in the life cycle. They still allow the animal to develop immunity because they don't eliminate the coccidia, but they significantly reduce it so that they're exposed to a lower level. We call them coccidia stats. Uh, two of them are what we call ionophores, that's Bovitec and Rumensin. They are technically antibiotics. Decox is not an antibiotic. Bovitec is approved for sheep, Rumensin for goats, Decox for both. It's customary to sometimes put a coccidia stat in the feed or mineral uh, and feed to the ewe or doe uh, during the last month of pregnancy. This way, she will shed fewer oocysts into the environment. Uh, coccidia stats can also be put in the water. Uh, Corid, which the drug name is Improlium, uh, this can be purchased over the counter, but it's not approved for sheep or goats, so it really is, a, it should be, instead of RX, it should be extra label drug use. However, I will say core, and I'll talk about this on the next slide, is actually a better treatment than it is a prevention. Okay, on the non-drug side, natural prevention just starts with good hygiene, good management, good nutrition. You know, it starts with kids getting enough colostrum. It's not like they get immunity from the colostrum to coccidia, but they just get a good start and, and a good start of their immune system and they're healthier. Not overstocking pens, not overstocking pastures, avoiding hot spots on pasture, um, not mixing animals of different ages. All these things of good management will help to prevent coccidia. Uh, Cerisi lespedeza, which I'll talk about uh, later as well, has been shown to have uh, inhibitory effects on coccidia when, when lambs or kids consume Cerisi lespedeza, um, they have lower oocyst counts and they have uh, reduced signs of coccidia. I've got a question mark next to the oregano oil because that is something that has been looked at particularly in poultry. Uh, of course, they also look at the vaccine in poultry um, to see um, we're always looking for alternatives to antibiotics at this time. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, but it's at the bottom of that slide, is to keep in mind that these coccidia stats uh, particularly rumensin is highly toxic to horses. 
Uh, you shouldn't feed the other two to horses either, but rumensin particularly is toxic to horses. It also has the narrowest margin of safety of any of those coccidia stats. If you get clinical disease, um, you have to treat, in, you go from uh, putting something in the feed or the mineral or the water to needing to individually treat uh, not only clinically parasitized animals, but probably animals that share the same pen space. No treatment is FDA approved for sheep, goats, or camelids, so you need to involve your veterinarian. You're able to buy Corid over the counter, but it's not labeled for sheep and goats. It's extra label drug use, so technically you should be working with your vet. A couple of years ago, the veterinary feed directive moved drugs such as the one you see on the left eye, methox. It's an antibiotic that goes in the water. They transitioned those drugs from over the counter to a veterinary prescription. So if you want to use the sulfa antibiotics, which are probably more effective, you're need, going to definitely need to work through your vet because you're going to have to get it from your vet. The Corid, uh, if you use it a lot or for an extended period of time, there is a little bit of risk with uh, polio, which is basically a thiamine deficiency. But these are the, the, the products that you need to look at if you have a clinical problem. Okay. Now we're going to switch and talk about the dewormers. I call it dewormers 101. And this first chart is to, to show basically there are three chemical classes of dewormers. And the dewormers in, in a particular class share a similar chemistry and they kill worms in the same manner. And the worms develop resistance to the manner in which they're killed. And when there's resistance to one drug in a group, cross resistance isn't usually far behind. If you remember in the old days, it used to be recommended that you rotate dewormers, use a different one each time. Well, in order to do that, you would need to move from one group to another. So if you were in group one, you would deworm with something from group two you wouldn't move from safeguard to valbazin because you essentially would be using a very similar drug. So the first group is the oldest group of dewormers, the benzimidazoles. Those are what we traditionally call the white dewormers. Those who've been around a while may remember a dewormer called thiabendazole or TBZ. That was the first of these wormers to be introduced to the market. And of course, uh, it became the worms became totally resistant to it and they removed it from the market. Uh, Safeguard, uh, Valbazin, and Synanthic are the three benzimidazoles. The latter one's not really used uh, to any extent, I don't think, in sheep and goats. The next group is called the macrocyclic lactones. Uh, ivermectin's been in the news lately because uh, apparently it had an in vitro effect on the coronavirus. Um, it was discovered a long time ago in soil, introduced to the market in the 80s, so it's 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 almost 40 years that we've had this wonder drug. Uh, the other drugs, uh, it's what we call an iver avermectin. So the macrocyclic lactones have two subgroups. So there's cross resistance, but it's not quite the same as being in the same subgroup. So the drug that's most similar to ivermectin would be Dectamax and Eprinometrin, okay? The other subgroup is what we call milbomycin, and that's where moxidectin comes in, or Cydectin, Quest is the horse product. So initially, cytectin kills ivermectin-resistant worms, but resistance to cytectin has occurred more rapidly because of its similarity to ivermectin. Generally speaking, the avermectins are more effective against external parasites, and the milbomycin, of which we only have one, is more effective against internal parasites. Group three, what we call the nicotinic agonists, or cell depolarizers, polarizers, they have some pretty long names in those two subgroups that I'm not even going to pronounce. There's two drugs of, of interest here. The first one is Levamisol, which goes by the name of Prohibit or Levamed. In the old days, it was called Tramisol or Levasol, and they even had it in an oblet. Today, it's just in a powder that you mix with water. The other drug is Marantel Tartrate, which is a drug that's put in the feed. The two at the bottom, uh, Pyrant or Strongid, uh, that's a horse dewormer, but it's within that group. A couple of years ago, Prohibit or levamisol was off the market, and they were actually going to start looking at strongid. Fortunately, Prohibit came back on the market. This next chart just shows you the dewormers that are FDA approved for sheep. So 
sheep producers in the United States are very lucky. They have a drug in each class that is approved for sheep. And in the case of the macrocytic lactones, they have one in each subclass. So this just basically summarizes um, the label information on these medications. And I've highlighted a couple of things. The first one is uh, valbazin. Um, it has a pregnancy restriction. So you don't want to use this during the first 30 days of pregnancy or 30 days after the male was removed. Um, if this drug is effective, you can see it's a pretty broad spectrum drug. Uh, again, it's the one that's effective against the uh, adult stage of liver flukes and also effective against hay forms. Ivomec, um, what's significant about this is its efficacy against external parasites. Uh, it, it is specifically labeled for the control of nasal bots, um, but also has efficacy against ticks and lice and, and things like that. Uh, Cydectin, uh, one of the significant things about Cydectin, again, it's effective against externals, but doesn't carry that label for sheep. Uh, but it's a persistent activity dewormer, meaning it continues to work some after you initially deworm it. That's a good thing and a bad thing. If, an, if a dewormer is persistent and it stays in the, in the system, it makes it easier for the worms to develop resistance to it. Uh, prohibit on the end, I have the safety uh, highlighted there. Uh, this has the narrowest margin of safety of, of any of our uh, dewormers. You can see you can overdose uh, ivermectin 20 times, uh, whereas levamisole is only three times, so it's pretty important that you have be somewhat accurate on your weight when giving levamisole. Uh, the chart looks a bit different for goats and, and goat producers. Um, you know, it's not a good situation in terms of the products that you have FDA approved. Safeguard is approved. Uh, the problem with Safeguard is that uh, it is not going to be effective at the labeled dose. The company knew, knows that, but, but even, um, even at double, triple, it's one of the dewormers along with Valbazin that has the highest degree of um, resistance. Uh, Valbazin has a conditional license for liver flukes in goats. Once again, I highlight the um, pregnancy restriction. Uh, the Morantel, which is uh, sold under various trade names, some trade names as simple as goat dewormer, uh, is pretty safe. Um, uh, uh, it's, the, it's a product that you have to feed, um, which could have some, some unique applications. The key thing on this is it has a very long meat withdrawal, 30 days, but no milk withdrawal. And that's pretty important for, for dairy goats, or can be pretty important for dairy goats and dairy sheep. More often than not, um, we're looking at extra label um, dewormers for goats. And basically I've taken some of the similar information from the sheep chart and added in, um, of course, the two products that are approved for goats. Again, to reiterate the pregnancy restriction on goats for Valbazin. Um, down at the bottom, the last two rows give the, or last three rows, give the dosages, the meat withdrawals and the milk withdrawals for these medications. This information, is um, some information that was put together by a couple of vets in the American Consortium for Small Ruminant Parasite Control, because it's pretty hard to find some of these withdrawal periods and these dosages. Typically, goats require one and a half to two times the sheep dose. So if you're using Cydectin and the label and what the label dose is, you double it. So the one that you do one and a half times is Levamisol, and that's because of its narrower margin of safety. So typically double the dosage for goats, one and a half for levamisol. Uh, it's because goats de metabolize the dewormers quicker and they don't stay in their system as long. Okay, still talking about anthelmintics, we're gonna talk about resistance. Again, that's the motivation for a lot of what we're doing now is the fact that the, de the worms became resistant. They have developed, varying degrees of resistance to all the dewormers and all the dewormer groups. Remember, cross resistance within dewormers of the same group. Now, resistance varies quite a bit. It varies by geographic location. Do I expect the degree of resistance to be in high, as high in Alberta as I do Louisiana? Absolutely not. Resistance is still in Alberta, but it's not gonna be at the same level as it is in a climate where parasites are more problematic and where deworming has had to occur more frequently. Resistance is a result of frequent deworming, frequent, you know, constant exposure uh, by the worms to the drugs. The more you deworm, the more resistance. 
There's some other factors too, and we'll talk about that a little bit. It also varies from farm to farm. You know, if you hardly ever deworm, chances are you're gonna have some efficacy on your farm, okay? What the wor resistant worms do is they pass those genes on to the next generation. Resistance in Labamisol is a little bit different than the others. That drug's been around a long time, yet it tends to be one of the most effective uh, because resistance is not as permanent. I believe it's, it's sex-linked. Um, and what we define resistance as is when fecal egg counts are reduced by less than 95%. If you look at this chart, which is from England, it shows what happens when the dewormer is working. So as that, as that curve goes down, you get below, you know, you can start to get reduced performance between five and 50% resistance. Once you get to that 50, you're gonna start having a, a situation where that drug by itself is not an effective treatment, okay? A lot of studies have been done to measure resistance. When I was up in Alberta a few years ago, they had some preliminary work on some resistance. When I was in Oregon two years ago, same thing. They were starting to collect some data on resistance. Four years ago now, it's been we got some, some funding from the ASI Let's Grow program to test 30 farms, 10 in Maryland, 10 in Virginia, and 10 in Georgia to look at the warmer resistance. Okay. What we found is that 100% of the farms in these 30 farms were resistant to the benzimidazoles to Safeguard and Valbazin. Um, almost all of them were resistant to ivermectin. So two of our groups, or half of our dewormers, all of the farms had resistance. And I can tell you that it just wasn't 95%. The, there was only one farm out of the 30 that had any kind of efficacy whatsoever with Valbazin. Ivermectin was a little bit better, but still moderate to high levels of resistance. As we looked at uh, Levanosol and Moxidectin or Cydactin, Situation was a little bit different. Um, a lot of resist, all, all the farms in the South, Virginia and Georgia or, or South of Maryland were resistant to, to Cydactin. Again, same group as Ivermectin, very similar to Ivermectin, and it's been around long enough, so all the farms were resistant. Maryland, about half the farms were. Uh, when we look at a Levamisol or Prohibit, um, all the, nine out of the 10 farms in Maryland all had susceptibility to Levamisol. One farm was at 90%, and you can see that further South, Virginia and Georgia, um, the most effective drug, but still a lot of resistance issues. So, so that was a situation four years ago. I could give you data that went back 10 years ago. It is only getting worse. And it is usually worse farther south. And again, it, that is related to the parasite challenge and the necessity of deworming, okay? So this is a reality. It's not a debatable point. So how do you find out if you have resistance to the drugs on your farm? Okay, you deworm an animal and it dies. That doesn't mean it was resistant and vice versa. There's two testing methods of testing that you can determine um, dewormer resistance and you really ought to do them. The first one is just a fecal egg count reduction test. So you do fecal egg counts before you, you, before you deworm them, 10 to 14 days later, you do a second count, you compare the two and you're looking for a percent reduction. You're hoping it's above 95 and you'll get a number, okay? You need 15 animals for each dewormer. So if you wanted to do, uh, you know, Valbazin, Safeguard, or Valbazin, Ivermectin, Cydectin, and, and uh, Prohibit, you'd need 60 animals. So chances are a lot of flocks aren't big enough because the other thing you need is they need to be at least 250 eggs per gram, okay? You get that U or do, or especially that U outside of that pair of partner period, and her egg counts are usually pretty low. So it takes a lot of animals. It's very labor intensive. The cost, you may spend $5 on a sample, you may spend $20 on a sample. Best thing to do is to learn to do it yourself. We just did a webinar on fecal egg counting. I'm gonna to try to get that video up pretty soon, um, but you can learn to do it yourself. Microscopes are inexpensive. A easier way to do it, you just have to put out more money initially, is what's called a drench right or a larval development assay. It's a lab test. It determines resistance to all of the dewormers, all the dewormer classes simultaneously from a single pooled fecal sample. You only need about eight to 10 animals. You'll also get the larva identified, but you won't get a percent. You'll get resistant, which is below 90%, suspected resistance, which is below 95%, and susceptible, which is above 95%. Um, you can delve into the data a little bit more to get some relative levels of resistance. 
um, but, it's, but it is different than the um, fecal egg count reduction test. You need at least 500 eggs per gram to run the test. The only place that does it is the University of Georgia. The last I saw it was $450 a sample. That's a, a big uh, a kind of sticker shock because it might actually be more now, it might be five or $600. But if you, if you have a problem, it gives you very valuable information and it's money well spent. And by the time, if you pay people to do the fecal egg counts, you're probably gonna spend that much money and more. So those are the two alternatives you can do to determine resistance. If you do a fecal egg count reduction on one animal, that's gonna tell you whether the treatment worked in that one animal. But you need the numbers of animals to actually figure out if the drug, or if the worms are resistant to the drug. I hope that makes sense. One animal, was that treatment effective? Lots of animals to tell you if whether there's resistance to that drug. What are the things that, that, that led us to this point and that accelerate resistance? Frequent deworming, okay? More than a few times a year, that's what we initially said. Treating everybody in the flock or herd, you know? I bring up 20 sheep and I deworm them all. Treating on the calendar, okay? It's a frost, I'm gonna deworm them all. I'm gonna deworm them every two months. Underdosing, underdosing. A lot of people, including me, don't weigh your animals when you treat them. When in doubt, overdose. I know that doesn't sound good, but it's better to overdose. The dewormers are safe, levamisol, is still relatively safe. You're not gonna think a 100 pound animal weighed 200 and that's only two, two X on the dose. Uh, in the old days, we used to recommend you treat them and move them to a clean pasture. Don't wanna do that anymore if you treated all of them because then the only worms that are deposited onto that pasture are resistant worms. Need to put the drug down in the gullet and the esophagus, not in the mouth, okay? Persistent activity dewormers like cytectin, they actually can promote resistance in injecting a dewormer can promote resistance. An oral dewormer, a drench clears right out of the system. An injectable one does not leave the system quick enough. If, you, if I were to graph it, there'd be a tail and that low level of that dewormer makes it easier for the worms to develop resistance. Pour on dewormers were not developed for the skin of a goat, the hair of a goat or the fleece of a sheep. So you put an, a, a pour on dewormer on their back and it may not, get the same dosage that it needs. And again, that makes it easier for the worms to develop resistance. Not to mention neither of those two are FDA approved and legal. Uh, rotating dewormers, again, that was an old uh, recommendation. Feeding dewormer to a group of animals. If I fed uh, a dewormer to five goats, one would get half, one would get none, and the other three would split what's left. So I run that risk of under treating an animal. I think if you're gonna feed a dewormer to an animal, you should feed it to them individually like on a milking stand. Uh, and any improper use of dewormers, any improper storage, calibration of equipment, uh, that sort of thing. Okay, combination treatments. We're talking about dewormers, we're talking about resistance. One of the recommendations that's come out because of the resistance issues is the concept of a combination treatment. And that simply means deworming with more than one drug at the same time to kill the same worms. It's not trying to kill tapeworms and roundworms. It's trying to use more, uh, two different drugs, three different drugs to kill barber pole worm, okay? That's what a combination treatment is. Because what research has shown is that the combination treatments are now the best approach. Unlike rotating a dewormer, we get an additive, an additive effect. If I rotate them, it kills, let's say 80% of the worms this time, it kills 80% of the worms the next time. If I, if I combine them, and this chart shows uh, how the, what the effect of combining drugs with different efficacies would be. So I start with 1,000 eggs per gram, I kill 90% of them, I've got 100, the next drug kills 80, I'm down to 20. So it's trying to get as low an egg count as possible, as few worms surviving as possible. The sooner we start using the combination, the better off you'll be. Research has shown that when you combine combination treatments with other best management practices, we may actually revert some of these dewormers back to susceptibility to the worms. So recommended combination treatment is to give the most potent drug from each class. This chart shows what you would treat a sheep, a goat, and a camelid with. Okay, these are dosages from the American Consortium for Small Ruminant Parasite Control. For sheep, they're all labeled dosages because all of these medications are labeled for sheep. For goats and camelids, they are not labeled. So the information comes from the consortium 
And from a legal standpoint, the combination treatment for goats and camelids is extra label and requires the involvement of a veterinarian. Some recommendations for giving combination treatments. Give each drug separately in a different syringe. Do not mix them. They are not chemically compatible. We do not have combination drugs available in the US. Maybe one day we will. Other countries, they may be available. Give a full dose of each drug. If you give half doses, you just encourage the worms to develop resistance. Use all oral drenches. Whether you're giving a combination treatment or not, everything needs to go down the gullet. Give the drug sequentially one after the other. Observe the withdrawal period of the drug with the longest withdrawal period, which is generally cydectin. Now, here's a key part. Selectively treat. Only give the combination treatment to animals that require treatment based on a FAMACHA score five-point check on, what, on some of these targeted selective treatment strategies, which I'm going to talk about in a bit. Again, this is a strategy that the experts recommend that you implement, even if you have a dewormer that's more than 80% effective. So Cydectin and, and Levamisol still work on your farm. They still recommend that you do a combination treatment. Going to talk a little bit about the natural or alternative dewormers. You're going to notice that I always put the word dewormers in quotes because I don't really consider them dewormers. A dewormer kills parasites. Okay. And so whatever we're talking about has to meet that requirement. So hundreds, I don't know, maybe thousands of plants and other things have been said that they have some sort of effect on parasites. I mean, a lot of stuff. The problem we have, and, and certainly from when you think of my perspective as an extension specialist, there's no proof. It's kind of like, again, let's talk about ivermectin having in vitro activity against the coronavirus. You know, I mean, it doesn't have any effect. You know, we have no reason to think it has effect against, actually has an effect against it. Um, because you need to do a study that shows that it, it works. And, and when, we, when we look at a lot of stuff out there that people say works, there's no studies um, or they're inconsistent or there's only one and it's not repeatable. So that's one of the challenges. That doesn't mean something out there couldn't work because a lot of research is being done to look at alternatives. Um, you know, the, 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 the drugs that we have, they're actually very good products, um, safe products, but you know we're at a time where we really like to move away from drugs if we can. And so a lot of research is being done, looking at a lot of different things. And my hope is that in years to come, we may actually identify stuff that, that meet the, the, the definition of a dewormer, meaning you, could, you treat a clinically parasitized animal and it saves its life and it reduces its egg count. One of the other challenges we have with some of the natural, quote, natural dewormers, is their potential for toxicity. A perfect example is copper sulfate. Copper sulfate did is an all-time dewormer, um, but was highly potentially toxic to sheep. Doesn't mean it killed every one of them, but it certainly killed one more than was acceptable. Uh, nicotine sulfate is another dewormer that's been historically used and still is used. Uh, a lot of different recipes of, of how nicotine is used, but again, there's some potential uh, for toxicity there. I have an old vet book that said they used to use gasoline. You know, if you kill the animal, you kill the worms too. So, so we have two issues with, with, with natural. One is proving that they're effective, and the second, is there any potential toxicity issue? But with that said, maybe, again, we'll be able to identify something in the future maybe oregano oil will will some you know maybe that's something that that will be able to be proven and it's not just dewormers you know we're trying to find alternatives to antibiotics as well so i'm going to give you a little bit about um my um there we go my perspective on natural or alternative, and again, dewormers in quotes, because they're not really dewormers. So I don't think they're likely to replace what we call the, the dewormers, the synthetic dewormers, the drugs, the chemical, whatever you want to call them. They're not likely to replace, but I think they have, they will perhaps complement dewormers. 
and, and they can do them in different ways, uh, disrupting the free living stage of the parasite. Biowormer is a perfect example of that. It's not a dewormer, but if you feed it, it is going to disrupt that parasite life cycle. And I'm gonna talk about that in a few slides later. If what you're giving them improves their natural immunity, um, and that helps. If because you're doing it, you're improving the overall management of your flock or herd, maybe you're seeing them more frequently, maybe you're feeding them every other day or feeding them every day a little bit. What I hope happens or what I think can happen is that that's gonna reduce the number of animals that actually need dewormed. So that's why I say complement. It's not necessarily gonna replace it, but maybe you have 20 animals and in the past you probably needed to deworm 10 or maybe what you're using, I only had to deworm two, but I still had to deworm the two. So it's okay to use any, any of these natural products, e even if they're unproven, so long as you continue to regularly look at your animals to see if they need treated, continue to do FAMOSH scoring, body condition scoring, and then when an animal needs treated, kind of shove a drug down its throat or two. Make sure, when it's clinical, make sure you give it something you know is gonna work, but alternative dewormers or natural dewormers, whatever we want to call them, herbal dewormers, they may, um, they may be part of that integrated or holistic approach that reduces the number of animals that actually need treated. So that's kind of my philosophy. Now with that said, there is one quote, I don't like call it one natural or alternative uh, product that has had some proof that it works and some consistency, and that is copper oxide wire particles. Now, I think it's kind of funny when we call it, to say it's not a chemical dewormer, because copper is a chemical, it's on the periodic chart, but it's not a, a dewormer uh, drug when we think of. So what copper oxide wire particles are, and they, well first, a lot of studies have shown them to reduce barber pole worm infections in sheep and goats. Do not know if there've been any studies in camels. I do not, um, and only barber pole worms. So not any, no effect on coccidia, no effect on the scour worms, okay? And what they are is they're tiny needles of copper, little metal rods. And as a source of copper, they're slow release and poorly absorbed, okay? Unlike copper sulfate, which uh, poses more of a copper toxicity risk. All the research that's been done with copper oxide wire particles has not resulted in any toxicity issues with sheep. So copper is available. Uh, there's a product you can see, one of them's called Copashore. Co it's available, copper oxide wire particles are available as a copper supplement for cattle. The picture shows 12 and a half gram bolus. There's also available in 25 gram bolus. And then in more recent four grams. Now, what I want to say about that goat product is that is not a deworming product. That is a copper supplement product, okay? Because what we want to do when we deworm sheep and goats, particularly sheep, we want to use the smallest possible dose to achieve our effect. That is usually a half to one gram for a lamb or kid and one to two gram for mature animals. So it's by age, it's not by size. So theoretically, that goat bolus that's two gram could be used to treat an adult animal. Otherwise, you want to get these cattle boluses, Copashore, and you want to uh, repackage them into smaller doses for deworming sheep and goats. You can buy gel caps and weigh it out. I don't guess you can really see it in that picture, um, but you just repackage them into smaller dosages. You administer, you can buy little balling guns. Administering them, I will confess, is it can be a challenge at times. Fortunately, in recent years, they've kind of come out with some little balling guns that can be used because a pilling gun for pets is too, too small, and the bigger plastic um, balling guns um, are too big for that capsule. So they've come out with some in-between ones. There's a, I can't remember which company actually markets that. Just like the warmers, we want to selectively treat and minimize the number of treatments. Okay? Went the wrong way. There was a study done in Arkansas a couple of years ago, or I guess it's four years now, where they looked at using a dewormer plus copper oxide wire particles. So a different kind of combination treatment. This was done with lambs. Uh, so they had a control group that didn't get anything. They had valbazin, which generally doesn't work. 
and then copper and two brands of copper oxide wire particles and then they gave the valbazin plus the copper and as you can see from the data um, when they gave the dewormer and the copper oxide wire particles together they got a very uh, effective treatment you can see in the picture on the left you can see what it would look like repackaged um, the researcher said she has done some other gotten similar results um, but just hasn't published them i would love to repeat this study uh, with goats especially and maybe with ivermectin as well, the other dewormer that doesn't tend to be very effective. In our area, cydectin and levamisole are still pretty effective, so I'd like to try it with those. I actually uh, would love to find a farm interested in doing this. We would just need to do before and after fecal egg counts and have four groups of animals, and I'd say at least 20 animals per group uh, to see if this is repeatable. But it looks pretty encouraging if we could uh, use them in combination. Uh, it's really important to use copper oxide wire particles safely, particularly with sheep, because if you're a sheep producer, you say copper, and a light bulb went off. Um, the thing to keep in mind about copper is copper metabolism is very complicated. Um, animals need it. It's a, they have a dietary requirement for it. Um, but it has different absorption rates. Uh, different forms of copper are absorbed at different rates. The age of the animal affects absorption with young animals absorbing it uh, more highly. Uh, and then there are numerous antagonists that interact with copper. For example, molybdenum binds with copper and makes it less available. So if you had high molybdenum, you could end up with a copper deficiency. If you had low molybdenum, you could end up with a copper toxicity. Uh, sheep have a very narrow margin between what is their requirement and what becomes a toxicity. And, and there actually aren't toxic levels of copper printed in, in, in nutrition books anymore because it depends on so many different factors. So when an animal consumes uh, copper in excess of its dietary requirement, it accumulates in the liver until a toxic level is reached. So it's kind of like filling up your glass, you know, once you, you can keep filling it and then when it reaches that level, it spills. Again, sheep are especially vulnerable to toxicity. It can occur in goats, and it has. So my suggestion is, and our recommendation of the consortium is, before using copper, and periodically, <coughs> assess the copper status of your animals. And to do this, you need to submit their liver or kidneys to a diagnostic lab for a mineral profile. So if you take an animal to the slaughterhouse, you can get the liver and kidney. If you have an animal uh, die, uh, particularly one that dies more of natural causes and not a disease, you could, um, you could do that. And not only will you find out about copper, but you'll find out about other minerals as well. And that'll give you an idea of what's going on at the farm. I would not recommend using copper sulfate for dewarming. Um, it's, again, it's not that it's going to kill all the animals, but it is certainly a higher risk of toxicity than it is the copper oxide. Nor would I recommend feeding minerals that are high in copper. Again, particularly with sheep, because um, you don't want to just, this is something that you should be armed with knowledge before you start monkeying around with copper. Because again, it, it's very complicated. Uh, sheep are very sensitive. Uh, prior research has shown that, that copper in the mineral really doesn't have any effect unless you put it at sufficiently high levels, which, you know, think about how sheep, how animals eat mineral. Maybe it's not a toxic level of copper in the mineral, but maybe this animal just pigs out on the mineral and consumes too much. So you gotta be really careful about adding copper to the diet of uh, animals, but particularly sheep and particularly certain breeds. Now, we're gonna talk about another natural option, a non-drug option, and it, it's not a dewormer, but the worm-killing fungus. Somebody was asking about this uh, during the break. Uh, what do I mean by the worm-killing fungus? What's well, called Ludingtonia flagrans. It's a naturally occurring fungus that traps and kills infected roundworm larva. So it kills the larva for the barber pole worm and the scour worms. It has no effect on coccidia, it has no effect on tapeworms, okay? It's roundworm. Doesn't matter what kind of animal is consuming it. Doesn't matter. Sheep, goats, cattle, horses, chickens, pigs. Most of the research, or the research has been done on uh, sheep, goats, cattle, and horses. So when it's consumed by the livestock, it reduces pasture infectivity, which results in lower fecal egg counts, less worm burdens, and less deworming, okay? It's a feed-through product. It has no effect in the animal. The company needed to find a fungus 
they could survive digestion because they didn't need the fungus in the soil, they needed the fungus in the manure where it could attack the larva. And so they found one, and so it has no effect in the animal, you just feed it through. So if an animal needs dewormed, it still needs dewormed. The fungus is not gonna have any effect in the animal. The fungus is aimed at the affecting the larva and reducing the recontamination of pastures. Bioworma is safe for all animals. It has no withdrawal period and it's not harmful to the environment. So it's got a lot of positive things going for it. It was only uh, entered the US market uh, last year, about a year ago. Um, I can't speak for some of the other countries that are, that are participating in this webinar as to whether or not you have um, bio or biowarma is the product name, biowarma. Okay. If, uh, if your country doesn't have it, um, I can give you the name um, of, of where, well, actually in another slide, I'll tell you what to do. So there's two products that, that this company in Australia is marketing. It, they worked on it for more than 20 years doing research. We have had similar research done in the United States with similar fungus, but there was nobody to commercialize the product. Uh, this Australian company has commercialized the product. There's two products. One is Biowarma itself. So Biowarma is a feed additive that contains 34.6% of that fungus. The dosage is 0.1 ounce per 100 pounds. Pretty difficult to dose that out to a group of animals or to an individual animal. If you look at Premier One Supplies in Iowa, they are one of the just, uh, uh, resellers of Biowarma. That cost would be about 21 cents a day for a 100 pound animal. Okay. Because the dose is so very small, Biowarma is meant to be mixed in a large batch of feed or, or mineral. It's not really meant to dole out 0.1 ounce. Think about a 50 pound animal, you know, you're giving 0.05 ounces. That would be very difficult to do. Unfortunately, Biowarma cannot be pelletized. It also cannot get wet. Due to EPA restrictions, it's not a drug. So it's not regulated by FDA, it's regulated by EPA, which is the Environmental Protection Agency. Sales are limited to veterinarians and feed mixers. So you as a producer are not able to buy Biowarma and take it to your feed company and have it mixed in. You weren't until recently. Premier One Supplies is now able to sell Biowarma because it has veterinarians on its staff. Premier merged with Pipestone, uh, I don't know, a year or two ago. And so they now have veterinarians on staff. So you can buy Biowarma from their website. So I don't see any reason why you can't buy Biowarma and have a feed mixed. Or, or something, okay? Now, Livamol with Biowarma is the other product that, that is sold. Livamol is a nutritional supplement that contains two point, what is it, two, I can't, my slide is covered up, 2.2 or 2.4% of the fungus. So way less fungus, okay? Consequently, the dose is 1.6 ounces per 100 pounds. That is something that you can dose out to an individual animal or to a small group of animals but the cost calculates to 59 cents a day if you use Premier's prices, okay? And that's their straight price, it's not a bulk price and it doesn't include shipping. So Bioworma is about a third of the cost of, of uh, Livamol with Bioworma. You should mix Livamol with other feed, uh, thoroughly mix it. Um, it is permissible to top dress it or to feed it alongside another feed. And anyone can purchase it. No, nobody's purchases are limited. So, so how, do you, how would you use Biowarma? Well, if you follow the recommendations on the label, you deworm your animals prior to feeding it and put them on a low burden, pa uh, burden pasture. Doesn't mean a clean pasture, but one that has a low level of infectivity. You need to feed it daily. Uh, there's some people in our consortium who think you can feed it every other day and get a similar result. You can see the results that research has produced there on the lower left corner. It's reduced pasture infectivity, 68% on average on sheep, 86% on goats, 81% on cattle, and 84% on horses. Some pretty impressive numbers, particularly for goats. You wanna feed during periods of high worm transmission, which is over 40 degrees. Yeah, that's a good bit of the year in, in, in a lot of places. You wanna feed it to the animals that are most susceptible to worms. And that would be young animals, a couple of months old to 
through to yearling stage or to the peripartridge female. And that's in general who's more susceptible to worms, period. Particularly, I'd say not even going up to 12 to 14, but that kind of three to eight month old lamb and kid is pretty susceptible. And you need to feed it to as long as it takes to, to maintain, I think I left a word out of that slide, a low worm status. Our consortium feels that that'll probably be at least 60 days. Our consortium and others are gonna do research with BioWarma and hopefully um, you know, help come up with strategies of, of how to uh, put it into your program. Um, I wanna, if BioWarma is something that interests you, I wanna invite you to a webinar next Wednesday, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, Chris Lawlor, who's with International Animal Health, uh, the company that manufactures and markets BioWarma will give a short presentation and then he'll answer questions. And um, I will record it and I will uh, put it on YouTube as well. But if this is something that interests you, I'm pretty excited to have him talk about it rather than me. Because I ask him a lot of questions uh, because I get a lot of questions, but here you'll be able to directly ask him questions. I can tell you the concerns that I've seen on the Premier website are two concerns. One is the palatability, uh, that the animals don't, don't always readily eat it. And Chris says, you know, you definitely need to mix it with other feed and maybe you need to, to gradually introduce it, you know, a little bit at a time. In turn, the other uh, common comment is cost. Uh, it is costly and it's like everything in life though, you have to figure out where your cost point is. Um, and it's not something that maybe it will pay for itself in the first year, but maybe over time it, it will or maybe your system is something that you really needed. I, um, you know, if other things aren't an, aren't an option, maybe this is the one that'll do it for you. So I would encourage you to, uh, to go to this webinar if, if it interests you. Okay, you'd think that, that this was the title of my presentation, I'm finally getting to what we call integrated parasite management. Basically what I call integrated parasite management is simply a combination of management practices and proper use of dewormers. To, to effectively control parasites. And hopefully you'll put more emphasis on the things on the left. But when you truly need to treat an animal, then we implement the things on the right. So let's talk a, a little bit about those. One of the first ones, and I think we, we actually ignore this a lot, and we're probably also, it's a big issue right now when you think about COVID-19, and that's immunity. You know, appreciating that immunity is a natural response to something, and it is normal for sheep and goats to have parasites and they are born without them. And it's normal for them to be exposed to them, hopefully at low levels, but levels that are high enough for them to develop immunity, but low enough not to develop clinical disease. And immunity varies. Um, this chart is for lambs, but you could easily, or sheep, you could easily substitute, I think, goat terms in it and camel terms in it. Um, recognizing that uh, in the first group, Lambs that are less than five months of age and have never been exposed, have had less than five months exposure are highly susceptible. Uh, immunity, meaning less susceptible, is, is reflected with these plus signs. So you can see a lamb less than five months that's underfed is the most susceptible animal on this chart. The next most susceptible animal on this chart is a yearling that is nursing twins and is over underfed. And then the other one that's very susceptible is the mature female that is nursing three and is underfed. So what this says is immunity varies by age with young ones most susceptible. It is affected by production. So more babies, more susceptibility, and it's affected by nutrition. Well-fed animals are more immune than underfed. The other thing I failed to mention with age is that yearling. She's, um, she's kind of that in-between thing. Uh, she is more susceptible uh, than a mature female, um, in most cases less susceptible than lamb, but she's another group that's highly susceptible. So when you think about control programs, who are the ones at higher risk? Can you separate out the yearlings? Can you separate out the, the females with triplets for preferential management? And by all means, provide proper nutrition to all of these production classes. When you lamb and kid can affect your parasite risk, you can time that to minimize your risk. Now, that's gonna vary by climate and some other factors, 
but you can lamb and kid at a time when the parasites are less active. In our climate here in Maryland, that would be the late fall and early winter. You can keep animals indoors or in dry lot during the parapartron period, and this will prevent the contamination of pasture. There's no reason to be in a hurry to wean lambs and kids if they're gonna be raised on pasture. There was a study done at Ohio State where they compared lambs weaned at 60 days and put on pasture versus those kept with their dams until 120 days. And there was a definite advantage to keeping those pasture reared lambs with their dams for 120 days. Now, if you're going to put them in a, if you're going to put them in uh, in dry lot and you're going to feed them out, then early weaning is just fine. Another alternative to reduce uh, parasite risk is to take the lambs and kids and put them in the barn or dry lot for finishing, and then they won't get infected with parasites. Put the ewes and the does out on pasture who have some natural resistance. Doesn't mean everyone should do it. It's just an alternative that can help minimize the risk. Nutrition is a huge part of uh, parasite risk. You saw it on that chart. There is a nutritional cost to parasites, especially protein. When they are infected with parasites, their protein is diverted from milk production and muscle growth to mounting an immune response. It's actually why animals that are more resistant and have lower fecal egg counts actually sometimes don't grow as fast as the one as other ones because that protein is being used to mount an immune response. So protein supplementation can improve resistance, it can reduce fecal egg counts. Now animals that are in poor body condition, I'm going to say two or less out of a scale of five, are more susceptible to the effects of parasitism and energy supplementation can help with that resilience or that tolerance. Minerals are important, I don't think we completely know all the details of, of how they might affect parasites, but where there are deficiencies, we certainly want to uh, supplement. If you determine that you have a copper deficiency in your goat herd, by all means, that should be part of a supplementation program. Even with sheep, that's true. Now, this slide could encompass uh, hours of talk because pasture is the vector by which parasites spread. So obviously there's so many different pasture and grazing management strategies that are going to impact risk or increase susceptibility. Safe and clean pastures, what is a safe and clean pasture? One that has no infection on it. So maybe a new pasture, annual pasture, uh, one that you use once a year, one that's grazed, uh, had cattle on it for the last year one that hasn't had sheep and goats on it for at least six months, if not a year. Usually we're aiming for low risk pastures, pastures that have a low level of infectivity. Rotational grazing is a very generic term. It could mean two pastures and moving them back and forth. It could mean 20 paddocks or 80 paddocks, okay? Rotational grazing by itself won't prevent parasites. It may actually make them worse. It just matters how you do them. A couple of just kind of basic things. The quickest time that it takes for an egg to go to develop into infected third stage larva is about three days, four days. That's assuming environmental conditions are perfect. I guarantee it's not happening in Maryland right now. It's too cold, okay? But that's the quickest. So if you move them every three days, they should not be re-ingesting or ingesting infected worm larva. However, it then depends on how quickly you put them back on that paddock. Again, it's going to be very climate dependent. It varies from spring to, to, to summer to fall. But generally speaking, it takes about two to three months, probably on average about two months, to take that highly infected pasture to make it a low level infection. So if you do the math, that would be 20 paddocks, moving them every th three days. And then the challenge within them 20 paddocks of, of, of having water, of having um, um, shade or shelter, depending on your climate. But, but that kind of gives us the basics of divide, de designing a system. Three day minimum, two to three day pasture rest. If I rotated my pasture every 21 days, depending on the climate, that could be the worst possible time because it could take that, remember, barber pole worm average 21 day life cycle. It, it, it could take 21 days and then you'd be right at the worst time. So it, it depends. Three days will cover you no matter what because that's the shortest time, but it could be longer. And so that long rest period is also essential. Uh, Multi-species grazing could help. Uh, to be honest with you, research is conflicting on whether that's uh, effective. I just saw a study with goats and they said, no, it didn't have any beneficial effect, not from a parasite standpoint. It didn't have a negative effect, but it didn't, didn't help. 
Um, makes sense to compost manure before you spread it on fields. The best strategy period for goats is browsing. Goats were not meant to graze. One of the reasons they don't mount a very good immune response is that was not their evolutionary strategy to deal with parasites. It was to avoid them. So the more we can graze or browse goats, keep their heads off the ground, it's gonna be beneficial. Sheep will do some browsing too. I suspect, I don't remember which llamas or alpacas likes to browse. Bioactive forages, which I'm gonna talk about in just a second. An annual forage crop. It's a clean pasture. It's probably gonna be a highly nutritious pasture, okay? Mixed swords, legumes, forbs, not, forbs, not just grass. Minimum grazing height. Most of the worm larva is in the first couple of an in inches. Doesn't mean it doesn't sometimes get higher, but it, because it can, but most of it's in those first couple of inches. So don't graze below four inches, okay? All your pastures are three inches, get them off pasture, unless you're in a drought. Delayed grazing, I don't know that there's any proof that shows that if you wait till the dew lifts in the morning, um, it's gonna have any impact, but it sort of makes sense. Uh, pending them at night, I'm gonna make the assumption that they poop half at night and half during the day, so I'm gonna cut my infection level by half. It might also be a strategy for dealing with parasites. Zero grazing, that doesn't sound like grazing management, but not grazing putting them in the barn or dry lot. And when I say dry lot, there can't be any grazing, not even on the edges, okay? They don't have a source of infection or reinfection in a barn or dry lot. You know, there's other things that that involves. It's more of a risk for coccidia because animals are closer together, but it is a strategy and it does work, okay? Uh, the bioactive forages are simply forages that contain secondary plant metabolites that have anti-parasitic properties. Uh, a lot of work's focused on plants that have condensed tannins. Um, Sericea lespedeza is the one that our uh, research or our consortium has done a lot of research on. Somebody asked in the chat box about chicory. Ohio State's done some work. Chicory doesn't have near the amount of condensed tannins in it that Sericea does. That's a picture of a goat eating chicory at our research center. Birds foot trefoil also has some in it as well. There are other forages that have condensed tannins. Um, Sericea has probably produced some of the most compelling data. So Sericea lespedeza is a perennial warm season legume that grows under suboptimal soil conditions. It's non-bloating. Uh, it's actually a, an invasive weed in some states, I think like Kansas, so you can't even plant it. But hey, if you have goats out there that you can control that invasive weed while having a plant that's going to have a beneficial impact on parasites. So animals that have at least 25% of Sericea lespedes in their diet have been shown to have reduced uh, egg counts, worm burdens, coccidia oasis burdens, and clinical symptoms. And the research has been done with grazing, like you see here in the picture, uh, fresh forage. It's also been demonstrated with hay, silage, leaf meal, and pellets. In fact, the pellets have been promoted for coccidia. The, the downside is it's really difficult to purchase the pellets. Uh, Sericea lespedeza, uh, most of the work's been done with a variety called AU grazer. So if you're gonna uh, plant it, that's the one I would look at. Um, we have a lot of information on our website about Sericea lespedeza because of all the work that's been done. And I think a lot of research is gonna continue to focus in this area, looking at plants that may have uh, beneficial effects. And again, they're not dewormers. The whole idea is that by grazing or consuming these, these plants, fewer animals are going to require treatment. Genetic selection, uh, this is one of what I think is probably the best long-term, uh, short of raising animals in confinement, which isn't what most of us want to do, uh, is probably the best long-term strategy for dealing with internal parasites. Um, we have a webinar on it. Um, in June, uh, a lot of emphasis on it these days. A couple, and, and let's talk about the basics. So, from a genetic standpoint, uh, goats uh, maybe not as maybe it's not genetic, but just a species choice. Goats are more susceptible to parasites than sheep. If you've got straight, traditional grass pastures, sheep are probably a better choice than goats. If you've got some uh, some browse and some wooded areas and some ways that you can get goats out there browsing. Uh, then, they, then they may be the better choice or maybe a mixture of species, sheep, goats, and cattle. Within both species, we have documented differences in breeds with regards to parasite resistance. On the sheep side, uh, there's, a, there's breeds that, that are uh, native to the southeastern United States, uh, Gulf Coast native, there's uh, some other names, Louisiana, Florida native, Florida cracker. 
that have less um, problems with parasites. It's kind of a survival of the fittest thing. In order to survive in that climate, they had to develop a natural resistance. They are wool sheep, they grow a medium wool. The other group of animals that are resistant, more resistant to parasites are hair sheep, but only those with a Caribbean ancestry. So that would be the St. Croix is the most resistant breed, the Barbados black belly, probably the American black belly. Uh, composites like the Katahdin, the Katahdin has more resistance than wool sheep because it is half St. Croix. Royal white is half St. Croix. The Dorper comes from a different part of South Africa and there's really no suggestion that it has any parasite resistance. There was one study years ago that showed it was a little more tolerant of parasites, more resilient. There's some work in recent years that shows that the Texel breed, which is a terminal sire bull breed, uh, seems to have some resistance to parasites as compared to other breeds. Very different than St. Croix, it kind of lets the parasites get established before it starts reducing them. On the goat side, we have less data, um, but we, uh, Tennessee State University has probably done as much as anyone, um, and they have shown Kiko and Spanish goats to have less problems with parasites than, say, boar goats. And probably the myotonic is even a little bit better than the Kiko and the Spanish. Uh, key, myotonic and Spanish are basically kind of like that Gulf Coast negative. They're, they're kind of indigenous breeds that have evolved to survive in the climate. The Kiko being a New Zealand breed was kind of selected under those type of conditions and coming from a wet climate, it had some exposure to parasites. Uh, so uh, high susceptibility to the boar goat, the angora goat, and probably most of our dairy goats. But regardless of breed, there's as much variation within a breed as there is between breed. This is what we used to call the 80-20 rule. Actually, I think that's my next slide. Uh, parasite resistance is a moderately heritable trait. So about 20 to 40%, maybe not as high in goats, maybe higher in more resistant breeds. It is possible to select for resistance. So this is the one I wanted to talk about, what we call the 80-20 rule. Um, so fecal, if you were to take a group of animals and look at the fecal egg counts, um, they're not evenly dispersed in that flock or herd. Um, I call it the 30-70 rule because I, when I process the data from our 11 years of our buck test, I would find it followed more of a 30-70 rule. So what that means is, and you can see in this graph, 23 goats, which were 70, um, 23 of the goats had 70% of the eggs, so about a third of them or about 30% of them had 70% of the eggs, and then 56 goats had 30%. So every bar at the bottom represented a goat, okay? So this exists in our animal populations for the most part. If they've been unselected, just, just random natural populations, this is, is what they are. And so what this graph ought to tell you is all you have to do is find those goats in the red. And if nature doesn't kill them, you kill them. You know, take them to market. Don't select them for breeding. By all means, don't get a buck or a ram out of that end, okay? So this variability, this uneven dispersion provides opportunity for selection. We talk about selecting, from a genetic standpoint, selecting for parasites, two traits. They are very important and very different. When we use the word resistance, and I'm not talking about the resistance of the worms to the dewormer, but the resistance that the animal possesses. So it's the ability of the host, the sheep, goat, or alpaca, to reduce the number of parasites that establish, reproduce, or survive in the body. They do it in some different ways, and that's why I say the Texel uh, was different than the St. Croix, not as good as the St. Croix. So they don't let it get established or whatever, okay? We quantify resistance by fecal egg counts, the number of worm eggs per gram of feces. That's actually an estimate too. It's an, an indirect measure of the number of worms in the animal's gut. If you really wanna know whether the animal's resistant, you would have to count the worms in the gut. Well, that's not, that's done in research, but can't, you know, but the animal can't breed anymore. So we do it with the egg count, so we estimate. Again, a moderately heritable trait, possibly lower in goats, possibly higher in more resistant breeds. Okay, that's one trait, resistance. 
okay? Resilience, on the other hand, is the ability of that animal to tolerate that parasite load. Maybe he's got 4,000 eggs per gram, but he's a FAMACHA score two, body condition score three. He's gaining really good, okay? He's resilient to parasites. Now, he could have a low egg count or he could have a high egg count. It, 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 it varies. We quantify resilience by things we observe or measure, the FAMACHA, score, the body condition score, the average daily gain, pack cell volume if we drew blood, looking at their, their butt, you know, do they have a poopy butt, things like that. That's how we evaluate resilience. And ultimately, our, the way we're evaluating is, does he need dewormed? If he didn't need dewormed, he's resilient. He could still have 5,000 eggs per gram, though. He could still could be contaminating the crap out of the pasture, okay? It's still a heritable trait, but not as highly heritable as fecal egg counts. And the important thing to realize is when we compare these two, they are correlated. They definitely are. But that correlation isn't necessarily high. We, again, 11 years of our buck tests, we found the correlation between resistance and resilience to be uh, low to moderate. And, and by, by resilience, I'm saying FAMACHA score. So generally speaking, an animal with a high FAMACHA score, anemic, tended to have a high egg count, but not always, low to moderate. But where we want to make genetic improvement, we do want to do it on resistance on fecal egg count. Because if I just select the animals that are resilient and don't need deworm, I may be selecting an animal that's a heavy egg shedder. So we really do want to select our resistance. Lots of different ways to select for parasite resistance, okay? Uh, you can do it on your own farm. You can put a buck or ram in a performance test. There are buck performance tests in West Virginia and Oklahoma. Uh, there's an excellent ram test in uh, Virginia where all of them evaluate for parasite resistance. That's exactly what we did in our 11 years of our buck test. We tried to identify bucks that were low egg shedders, didn't need deworm, and had good average daily gains. Okay. EBVs, that stands for estimated breeding values. You sit, submit that data to a national processing center and you get back values that represent the genetic merit of that animal for parasite resistance. So an animal could be a, a typical EBV for a ram. Let's say this ram on the left was 50%. That meant his egg count was 50% higher or 50% lower than the average ram animal in that breed. Okay? That's ultimately where we're going to make the best genetic improvement is in these estimated breeding values. Different strategies for the males versus the females. And by males, I mean our breeding animals, our studs. We want the best. We want males that never need deworming and are low egg shedders. The best. Okay? With the females, you know, I have one ram or buck and I have 30 females to go with it. My strategy is probably... I'm gonna get rid of the worst, okay? If you're an elite seed stock producer, you're gonna select the best, but we don't wanna keep females that require frequent deworming and are heavy egg shedders. One of the things we need to be careful about on the female side is maybe she needs deworming because she's nursing three lambs. You know, we gotta make sure we don't uh, discriminate against productivity. Maybe that dairy goat needs deworming because she's my heaviest milker, okay? Or she's a yearling or something like that. So males, we want to really make sure we find the elite because he's going to pass his genetics on to a lot more animals than that female. Targeted selective treatment. Um, again, this is a concept that, that has evolved because of the high level of resistance to the dewormers and the growing resistance. And what targeted selective treatment is, is only deworming animals which require treatment or would benefit from treatment. Makes and when you think about it, what sense did it ever make to deworm everybody? They didn't need it, but we did it. And we have high levels of drug resistance. We don't want to treat the whole group of animals, ideally. Even if we don't selectively decide who we treat, at least pick out some that we don't need to treat. Targeted selective treatment increases what we call refugia. Refugia are worms in the system, whether they're in the animal or on the pasture, that have not been exposed to the dewormer or dewormers, and thus they remain susceptible. We want our farm to have as many of those worms as possible, and that helps us to slow drug resistance. It also 
by a targeted selective treatment, it, again, it helps us identify those susceptible and resilient or resilient animals. There's different tools to help us make that decision on who to treat. And um, the one, of course, we're talking about today a lot is the FAMACHA system, but also um, a few of these others I'm gonna mention as well. So the FAMACHA system was developed for small scale sheep farmers in South Africa due to the growing dewormer resistance. Don't know exactly what constitutes small in South Africa, but I don't think it was developed for people with 5,000 sheep. Its system was eventually validated for goats in South Africa. And by validated, I mean they took their FAMACHA card and they scored them and they did, uh, they did blood hematocrits so that they could make sure it's accurate. The system was brought to the US. It was validated for sheep and goats. A few years ago, it was validated for camelids, for llamas and alpacas. It's a system that evaluates or assesses the level of anemia, blood loss, which is the primary symptom of barber pole worm infection, also liver flukes in small ruminants and determine the need for deworming an individual animal. The name comes from the gentleman that developed it. Uh, his nickname was Fafa, so the Fa, his last name was Milan, Ma, and it's a chart, Fa Ma Cha. That's a picture of him in the, in the slide there. That's where the name came from. Initially, the Famacha cards were only published or printed in South Africa, now they're printed in the US. The one on the right is what they originally looked like. They were way too big. Uh, there's the traditional card, the one that you'll get uh, in the middle. Uh, this table just basically shows you um, what the card is. It, it has five clinical categories, five different colors, five treatment recommendations, and those colors and treat and everything has been correlated to a packed cell volume, so that blood hematocrit. That's where that originally came from. So, you know, again, the diagnostic test for the barber pole worm would be to pull blood and to determine what that pack cell volume is, whether or not that animal needed dewormed. So a uh, FAMACHA one or two, we don't deworm. A FAMACHA four or five, we do deworm. And as you can see, there's a question mark for number three. This is just a chart I put up. Um, you sometimes find, especially with goats, they're all three. And then there's a question mark, do I deworm them or not? So I kind of came up with where I might deworm a three and where I might not. I'd be more inclined to deworm a goat if it's a three, kids and lambs, pair of partner females, lactating females, where they were gonna, where they were under a high parasite challenge if I couldn't monitor them as quickly. Uh, when more than five to 10% of them are fours and fives, it's recommended that you do threes. If you're seeing downward trends in your school, your animals aren't in good body condition. And if you want to make sure you never miss an anemic animal, you're going to do a three. So that's just sort of some general guidelines for doing threes. Uh, so using the FAMACHA system, you need to check at appropriate intervals. And that's going to vary by the climate, the season, the animals, and the risk of infection and reinfection. In Maryland, we use a two-week um, interval during the summertime, our peak transmission season. Every once in a while, we would increase that to weekly when, when the risk was really high. And it might be more like that in the southeast. In the wintertime, um, if parasites are inactive, there's no reason necessarily to check them. One of the most important things, and, and, is, and is why you have to make a video, is the, to use the proper technique. And I do have a video I'm going to show you. It's called cover, push, pull, pop. You need to memorize that. Cover, push, pull, pop. Put it on a hat, make a sticker, write it on your hand. That's how you FAMACHA score them, and, and the video will show. We don't use half scores like we do with body condition score. If you're not sure whether it's a four or five, then it's a five. Uh, you wanna score in natural light. You wanna score both eyes. You wanna be consistent. You wanna learn your animals. There are occasionally animals that, that uh, give you false answers. You might find a goat always looks like it's four. You dewormed it the first time, but then you find out, you know, it's just a four and it's healthy otherwise. You wanna make sure you don't ignore other symptoms and factors, and you wanna replace the card as necessary because the colors do and can change. Okay, I'm gonna play a video for you. Hopefully it'll work. It's gonna demonstrate the FAMACHO scoring system. This is Dr. Ann Zajac um, and Catherine Peterson um, who do the online training already. Hi. 
So hopefully that, excuse me, hopefully that gave you a good idea of how to do it, what your video might look like. You'd be, it's remarkable when you follow that technique, how those membranes just pop out at you. They really do. They really do. And it's easy to score. If you don't use that method, it gets kind of frustrating for some people. Okay. Another targeted selected treatment strategy is what we call the five point check. The five point check addresses the limitation of FAMACHA. FAMACHA only works for parasites that cause anemia, basically the barber pole or maybe liver flukes, okay? The other parasites affect sheep and goats, and so the five-point check was developed, so this is kind of an extension. I also find it useful for making that decision on FAMACHA score freeze. Five checkpoints on the animal's body. You can see the eye for the FAMACHA score, the back for body condition, the tail to see if they have diarrhea or had diarrhea, the jaw for bottle jaw, and the nose for nasal bots. Same thing on the goats, except instead of the nose, um, we kind of changed it to look at the coat, you know, the, the condition of the coat, which can be an indication of, of uh, diseases, including parasites. So here's, here's the five points, and, and it lists kind of the different worms um, that are possible. Again, the uh, uh, FAMACHA score is the anemia, is the barber pole worm, liver fluke. Always be open to other things also causing these things. Body condition score, uh, you know, a lot of things. Bad, you know, poor nutrition can, can also cause a lot of this stuff. Uh, the fecal soiling, the dirty butt, the, the dag score, lots of different names. Uh, that's where we get those scour worms, the brown stomach worm and the, the bankrupt worm. Um, the jaw, again, is very similar with the uh, barber pole worm, the liver fluke. The nose is the nasal bot fly. Um, and the coat condition, that's kind of pretty generic, like the tail. We're not ever really looking at one of these things by itself, but we're looking at all of them together to make that deworming decision. Um, body condition, I would say, is probably the second most important thing to look at, and there are researchers uh, and producers around the world that probably use body condition score instead of FAMACHA, um, and one that tends to be a little bit easier when you got a lot of animals and one that at some point might be a lot easier to automate uh, than FAMACHA score. Lots of things can cause a loss of body condition, but, um, but certainly it can be an indication of parasites. Body condition scoring is, a, is something that every sheep and goat and alpaca and llama owner should do. It's very useful. It, 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 it can evaluate the health. It can determine market readiness. It can, it can evaluate your nutrition program. There are differences between sheep and goats and even between different breeds, but it's a very useful tool. And so we wanna look at body condition in conjunction with those other factors. We use a scale of one to five with half scores. One is emaciated, two is thin, three is average, four is fat, and five is obese. When that animal is thin, a two or below, that can be a good indication that that animal might need dewormed. Again, this is just, um, in words, what the different different scores are. Sometimes an animal's thin because it's not getting enough to eat. So when you're looking at the body condition, um, you're looking at it relative to some of the other animals in the group. If everybody's thin, it's possible everybody's parasitized, but it's also possible nutrition's at a very poor level. Uh, this is just a graphic that shows what you're looking at. The body condition score, typically you do it over the backbone and ribs and over the loin edge and you're feeling not only for fat, but also for muscle and fullness. Sheep, uh, hair sheep, thin sheep, and goats, you gotta keep in mind that they fatten from the inside out, so we don't expect them to have the amount of external fat that we see in wool sheep or other livestock. Uh, looking at the tail for fecal soiling or a DAG score, ever wonder where the term DAG came from? It just means the feces that are kind of stuck to the wool on a sheep. It's a sheepy term. 
but basically we're looking at in, an indication that they've had scours. And as I said, this is a primary symptom of those, of those um, other uh, stomach worms. And even if their performance is okay, you can imagine that, that being like this is problematic and you'd wanna clip those before they went uh, to market. Again, there is the scale. We used to score our goats on this scale um, from a zero with no fecal soiling to a central, you know, very covered uh, hind end, which, and you can see they give treatment recommendations here. Here's some charts about what we're talking about. Doesn't, the charts aren't quite as accurate, I think, as the FAMACHA score because there's a lot more subjectivity in it. There's a lot more things that can cause scours than FAMACHA, but it's the same kind of concept. Uh, bottle jaw, that one's pretty obvious. We've talked about that in accumulation of fluid under the jaw. Again, it's specific to uh, usually to barber pole worm, although you can get it with coccidian, you can get it with some other things. This is a definitely deworm. It's, it's, it's not even a what's the other things going on. It's just a definite deworm. Uh, this is what I mean by the um, nasal bots, just basically you're looking for a nasal discharge and goats were looking at the, the quality of that coat condition as an indication. Again, never by itself, collectively. Some other models that have been used to make deworming decisions, this is one called the happy factor. A happy sheep is a healthy sheep. It's been developed in Europe and New Zealand, and basically it, it, it's a uh, performance-based model. They basically use a lot of different factors to determine what that lamb should be gaining or what that calf should be gaining. They take a percentage of that, and if that lamb or calf didn't gain that, then he gets dewormed, okay? It works best in automated systems like you see here, where you have electronic ID, where you have automatic weighing and automatic drafting. Um, will it work for the barber pole worm? I know a lot of experts don't think it will. They think the animals, before they lose weight, will need, may need dewormed. Um, but uh, it, is, um, it is using the idea of performance. Some work in the tropics like Mexico and Brazil has combined FAMACHA with average daily gain and feel like that's a much better decision-making tool than FAMACHA by itself. Others have combined fecal egg counts with um, FAMACHA or body condition score, again, to take the information collectively to make decisions. This is a, a combined target selected treatment regime that I really liked. It was in a paper in um, uh, Canada. I just added the high producing dairy female on there. But, the, but their strategy was if a you and I could add, I would add a doe, possessed any of these criteria, she would get dewormed. Obviously, FAMACHA score four or five, she's anemic, she needs dewormed. Body condition score of two or less, she gets dewormed. She has bottle jaw if she gets dewormed. If she's got three offspring or more, she gets dewormed. If she's a first time mother, she gets dewormed, okay? Particularly if it's one lamb you're kidding at 12 months of age. And a lot of work, work in Europe, particularly France, has looked at focusing uh, uh, deworming on that high producing dairy dough. Um, because she is under a great deal of stress. Other factors that you might consider to make the decision is a fecal egg count, is what does the feces look like now? I already mentioned how you can look at the scores and trends of other animals. What did the animal previously score? What's the risk of reinfection? Uh, what plane of nutrition? How often? I talked about that with that other table. Uh, sometimes deworming is not enough. What do you do? We're going to have a webinar on that in a couple of weeks. Um, very Commonly, you need to move that animal off that contaminated pasture. Uh, you may need to give it supportive therapy, like something like red cell, uh, iron, uh, B-complex supplements, and put them on a high protein feed. Because uh, sometimes deworming, even with effective dewormers, isn't enough. The last thing I'm gonna talk about, and normally in these FOMACHA workshops, we would actually have hands-on fecal egg counting. To me, fecal egg counting are an important part of this discussion. You know, we recommend that you use FAMACHA and there's other criteria for making deworming decisions, but fecal egg counting is a very important part of um, managing parasites in small ruminants. There's two types of fecal egg counts. One is the one the vet usually does for your dog, a qualitative one. It's a simple fecal flotation. The feces are not weighed, the flotation solution is not measured. You can identify if there are eggs in there, maybe the general type of them, and maybe get a general idea of how many there might be. For the sheep or goat or alpaca or llama, it's not very useful. We expect a positive egg count. We really need to know exactly what the fecal egg count is. So a quantitative fecal egg count, the feces are weighed, the flotation solution is measured. Uh, yes, we can identify the general types of eggs, but specifically we determine the number of eggs per gram of feces. There's different methods for doing a fecal egg count, uh, and there are many uses 
of fecal A counts. So what fecal A counts can, can be used for? We already talked about the fecal A count reduction test. So a fecal A count can be used to determine if that dewormer is effective on your farm through 10 to 15 animals, okay? At least 250 eggs per gram. Do one animal and you find out if the treatment was effective. Do lots of animals and find out if the dewormer was effective. Use it to monitor the level of pasture contamination. You know, you're not sure how contaminated that pasture is. You started to use biowarma. Um, use it to identify animals that are more resistant or susceptible to parasites. We talked about genetics being one of the key um, strategies for dealing with parasites. It's resistance, A counts that we use, need to use to identify those animals. Combine it with the criteria we just talked about to make deworming decisions. If you look at an animal and don't know if it needs dewormed, don't do a fecal A count, do a FAMACHA score, body condition score. If you want to do it, that in addition, that's fine. The only time I would use, I would deworm based on the fecal A count is if the fecal A count is just really, really high. Our record was 56,000. That animal was actually okay, believe it or not. But who wants him spreading 56,000 eggs on, a, on the pasture, okay? Use it with a combination of factors to make that. By itself, it's not really reliable for making a deworming decision. Okay. What you need to do your own fecal A counts because that's going to be more cost effective. You just need a microscope with a 10x eyepiece, a 10x lens, which gives you 100x. A mechanical stage is well worth the, the expense. Uh, McMaster A counting slide, they're about 20 bucks. Um, there are other methods, but we basically teach the modified McMaster technique, which is that McMaster egg slide. You need a flotation solution, you can buy one or make one. It's that flotation solution that causes the, the uh, specific gravity causes the eggs to rise to the top so you can count them. You need a scale to weigh the feces. You need some of these other things that I'm showing you right there. Here's the procedure for doing a modified McMaster. Um, I will get the video up of our um, webinar in which we have a video of actually doing it. You weigh the feces. You um, measure out 26 mils of flotation solution. If you did two grams, you would do 28. It depends on the weights. You try to get four grams. Sometimes the animal won't give you enough. You want it fresh. You usually take it from the rectum. Um, this just gives you the procedure uh, for doing that. Okay, I apologize for stepping away for a second. My dog was going bonkers. Um, but, but this is the basic procedure. Uh, the formula you use to get egg per gram will depend on the, the amount of feces and flotation solution that you have. And there you can see what the eggs look like uh, and, and what kind of what the grids look like. Uh, here's a graphic and you can download this graphic from uh, that link I gave you at the beginning of the webinar. Uh, this shows um, all the different types of, of eggs that affect ruminants. Uh, they're not in color like this, but um, okay, there I have the stars. These are the ones you'd actually be looking for. Uh, some of you might be in climates where you might see the matadiris, which is a very large egg. Uh, we, again, we can't tell the difference between the brown stomach worm, the bankrupt worm, and the barber pole worm. They all look the same. The tapeworm eggs tend to be uh, triangular in shape. Uh, the coccidia are little ovals, like you can see in that picture. Usually a fecal egg count is the round worms, the strongjaw worms. And then you note what else you see. You can actually do coccidia oasis counts as well. Okay, lots of limitations to fecal egg counts. They're not highly accurate, especially when the egg counts are low. There's actually a, um, a system called the mini flow tack that is more accurate with low numbers of eggs. We're gonna use it for a cattle study where the egg counts are a lot lower. Uh, parasites vary in their egg producing ability. The barber pole worm is very prolific. 2000 eggs per gram is not that high. Uh, whereas some of the other species are high at 500 eggs per gram. As I mentioned, the immature worms, they suck blood but do not lay eggs. The inhibited larvae do not lay eggs. There's a day-to-day -day variability in counts. They're not always evenly distributed. Uh, looser, more water in the feces can, can affect the egg counts. Again, you can't differentiate the strongjaw worms at the egg stage. Not all parasites are pathogenic. This is particularly coccidia. Different procedures for doing fecal egg counts. You gotta make sure you compare apples and oranges always the possibility of human error, and you need to look at them as a snapshot in time. They have limitations, but they also have incredible uses.
Uh, this is just a graphic of um, the webinars that we're in the middle of doing. Um, we've done the first three and you can see we've got some more to go. And if these topics interest you, I would encourage you to um, either to participate in them or, or again, the plans are eventually that all the videos will be up on YouTube. It'll just take a little bit of time. So with that, I'm going to conclude my presentation. I, I can't believe I actually finished about what I said I was because believe me, I can talk for hours about parasites.